Hello, and welcome to the fourth and final installment of Looking Back to Look Forward, an interview series that the Carnegie Council has been producing this fall to mark the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. My name is Adam Reed Brown, and I'm the editor of Ethics and International Affairs, the Council's quarterly peer-reviewed journal published by Cambridge University Press. This series builds on the work of the fall 2020 edition of Ethics and International Affairs, and that issue features a special collection of nine essays on the UN at 75, organized and guest edited by Dr. Margaret P. Carnes. To explore the content in that issue, we encourage you to visit eiajournal.org. For this episode, it's once again my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carnes as our host. Dr. Carnes is Professor Emerita of Political Science at the University of Dayton, and since 2015, she's been a visiting professor in the Global Governance and Human Security PhD program at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. She's published widely on UN peacekeeping, post-conflict peacebuilding, global governance, and the future of the UN system. And I should also note that in addition to being our host and guest editor on our special issue, Dr. Carnes contributed a co-authored essay to that collection with Kirsten Hack and Jean-Pierre Murray titled, The UN at 75, Where are the Women in the United Nations Now? Today, Dr. Carnes is joined by Bertrand Ramcharan. Over the years, Dr. Ramcharan has held numerous high-level positions within the UN, including acting UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Today's conversation will center on exactly that, human rights in the United Nations. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to Dr. Carnes to get things started. Enjoy the discussion. Thank you, Adam, for that very generous introduction. And thank you, Bertie, for joining me in this interview and for agreeing to write an essay uh, on human rights for this special issue. Uh, when I was invited to do the special issue, human rights was clearly at the top of the list, and I couldn't think of anyone I would rather have had uh, to write this issue. But to provide others with a bit of an introduction, Dr. Burton, Bertrand Ramcharan of Guyana is a barrister of Lincoln's Inn with a doctorate in international law from the London School of Economics and the Diploma of International Law from the Hague Academy. He has been Chancellor of the University of Guyana, Professor of International Human Rights Law at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and also visiting professor at both Columbia and Lund universities. In his long career at the United Nations, Bertie served in the Center for Human Rights as Special Assistant to the Director, as the Secretary General's spe Chief Speechwriter, as Director of the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General in the UN uh, peacekeeping operation in the former Yugoslavia, as Director of the Office uh, at, of the International Conference on the former Yugoslavia, and also as political advisor to the peace negotiators in the Yugoslav conflict. He's also been director in the UN political department, focusing on conflicts in Africa. Uh, in the human rights area, yes, as Adam mentioned, uh, Bertie had the good fortune, but also the misfortune uh, to serve as acting UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in the following the death of Sergio de Mello uh, in the bombing of the UN headquarters in Baghdad in 2003. He subsequently also has served as commissioner of the International Commission of Jurists and member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. In 2019, Ramcharan received the award of eminent Caribbean jurist from the Caribbean Court of Justice. Where, where I'm, he's found the time to do so, I do not know, but Bernie has published several books on international law and human rights, including contemporary human rights ideas and modernizing the human rights system, as well as books on preventive diplomacy at the United Nations and international peace conferences. It's my distinct pleasure to do this interview with you, Bertie. Thank you. In your essay, you describe the UN human rights pillar as being in the throes of crisis. What do you see as some of the features of that crisis? Well, you know, the bottom line is that if human beings are being arbitrarily executed, tortured, enslaved, suffering discrimination on a widespread scale, trafficked, if violence against women is pervasive, then something is terribly wrong with the world and something is terribly wrong with the United Nations. And the United Nations Human Rights Council has a system, they're technically a system of investigators they're technically called special procedures. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to go into that now. But every year, they document all of these violations in numerous parts of the world. 
And so when I say that the United Nations human rights pillar is in crisis, what I mean is that it doesn't matter what the good intentions have been. It doesn't matter how many norms we've established. I, I, I re refer to that in the chapter. It doesn't matter how specious we are in saying the, the good things that the UN is doing. The bottom line is that people are being savagely treated in many, many parts of the world. And then now, of course, the UN as an institution does the best it can. The UN is its member states, basically. And since the establishment of the Human Rights Council in 2006, the terms of reference of the Human Rights Council explicitly state that the Council is to engage in dialogue and cooperation over human rights issues, even in the face of egregious violations of human rights. And then so you will find many, many situations that have come before the Council and the refrain from powerful states is, let us dialogue and cooperate. Well, I have to tell you in my career, I helped very much to establish these in the system of investigators. And I feel deep within my being that we cannot accept a situation in which people are being brutalized and then we just have to dialogue and cooperate mm -hmm. over it. There are other things that I could say, I could refer to what I would call um, structural factors or the symptoms of violations. But you've asked me a straight question, why is it in crisis? And I've given you my answer. It's a simple question. The ethical society at its core, there is a belief that one should be ethical towards one another. Well, I have to say for large parts of the world, there is no justice, there is no ethics. That's why I think that the UN human rights system is in crisis. It's interesting, so many people talking about the current time yeah. uh, might point to the rise of more authoritarian governments around the world, to yeah. your nationalism and populism, uh, but you have gone to deeper factors. But are these new developments or more recent developments um, something that also contributes to perhaps in deepening the crisis uh, around human rights? Yes, without the world, I helped one of my former colleagues write a chapter on populism and human rights. So I looked at the literature a bit. And I would allow myself to mention the case of Hungary. It is a European country. It, as a young um, researcher, I spent a week with the Secretariat of the European Commission on Human Rights in Strasbourg. So I kind of absorbed the spirit of the European Convention. And so now um, you have a phenomenon here, the, a populist government, basically moving away from the precepts. I don't want to put them on the spot. I'm just using this as an example. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving away from the precepts of human rights. And then I want to be fair. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, he established a commission on uh, to define what are unalienable rights, unquote. And there is no doubt that behind that, the idea was to diminish American recognition of what are inherent fundamental rights. So your question to me is populism, authoritarianism, and then without a doubt, yes, of course, one can point to many countries in the, in the world where authoritarian leaders are trampling over the rights of their own people and not having a regard this idea that um, this idea that countries, governments, should respect some basic principles, some basic norms in the treatment of their own people and in the way they relate with other countries as well. So yes, I would have to accept that without a doubt, populism, authoritarianism, and I'd have to say a fundamental lack of good governance in so many countries. You're a professor of, of governance, so you will understand that. And I, I, the phenomenon ex exists at both the international levels and the national level. And you know, this issue, 
I was not going to it, but after I left the UN, I did a degree in history with the University of London, then I did a degree in philosophy with the University of London. And so when I, at one stage, I had to look at the literature on um, human rights in um, some of the countries of the Near East and the traditions, the patterns that have brought them to where they are. So yes, without a doubt, uh, this issue of fundamental lack of good governance in numerous countries, mm -hmm. the major problem. Yeah, yeah. You organize your essay around five ethics. Yes. Ethics of human survival, normative ethics, ethics of protection, institutional ethics, and the ethics of the human predicament, which was an interesting way to approach the subject. And you argue each of these has marked the UN's contributions on human rights, but that it is particularly in the area of normative rights, and normative ethics, where the UN has made its greatest contributions to the cause of human rights. And yes, you know, the UN now faces what you call a tottering consensus. What made it possible in the first 75 years even including the Cold War years, to make this normative process, normative progress. And why are these norms now under such challenge? Well, you see, if one looks at the drafting of national declarations on human rights, the process is one in which people had grievances. They sought correction of those grievances. They made claims about rights. They articulated principles, and then they negotiated these principles. There is a book by a woman called Lois, or Loy, however you say it, Loy Schwer, S-C-H-W-O-E-R-E-R. -E -E and she wrote about the drafting of the English uh, Declaration of Rights, the Bill of Rights. And this was a process, and if you let me say so, it's a process in relation to the French Declaration, the American Declaration, grievances, claims, normative statements, uh, negotiations, uh, recognition of rights. So now this, it's the same process that has taken place at the international level. If we go back to the early years of the United Nations, uh, the Holocaust, uh, the, the, the launching of the Universal Declaration. In all of these processes, the Universal Declaration, the two covenants, the subsequent conventions, so you have a number of things happening. You may have a governmental initiative for a norm, for a, pro a proposed normative instrument. Often you have an NGO initiative. And so now the idea is launched that the UN should draft some rights. I remember when the UN Declaration on the Rights of um, Persons to Freedom of Religion or Belief was drafted. It was a very difficult negotiation. But so now, what you, your question to me is, what contributed to the success? Mm -hmm. Is this combination of governmental engagement governmental uh, negotiations, push, it, push from the NGOs, and persistence over a period of time. And there were many things that, for example, the Universal Declaration recognizes the right to property, but the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights does not. That's mm -hmm. part of the horse trading that took place. So at the end of the day, the answer that I want to give you, if I may, is that it is a patient process, a persistent process involving well-disposed governments, involving NGOs, involving academics. The, the vision of an international bill of rights was first um, put out, put forward by the great Sahar Lauterbach. He wrote uh, for the uh, American Jewish I get into trouble all of the time, whether it's the American Jewish Congress or the American Jewish Committee, but he wrote for one of them uh, a draft of an international bill of rights. And he put this work in his landmark work, an international bill of rights. So that it is this persistent combination 
And now let me give you an example, if I may. At the time when the idea was launched that there should be an international convention on the rights of the child, this idea came, for whatever reason, this idea came from the government of Poland. And the Western governments at the time, they were skeptical of this. Why is Poland pushing the idea of a convention on the rights of the child? But then the NGOs saw merit in this and the NGOs owned this process. And then the NGOs brought in UNICEF into the process and over time. So it's, um, it, I, I'm repeating myself now, but it is this persistent, patient process of commitment, negotiations, and compromise that has resulted in, and nowadays I want to say this, if the United Nations publishes a collection of human rights documents of the United Nations system and of some of the regional organizations. And it, the, you, there is hardly an area of the relationship between the individual and the state that you will not find a normative provision covering it. So that I, put the norm, the, I put the normative provisions as one of the, the great successes of the UN because I think Uthant want, once addressed the International Law Commission on which, by the way, I did my doctoral thesis. And Uthant said to the International Law Commission, the work that you are doing is for the long term. And so that these instruments in human rights are for the long term. So anyhow, you ask me how that came about and I've gone on a little bit as you can see. <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. that's all right. Okay. Yeah. But I'm curious if there's any particular areas today yeah. where you think norms need, still need to be established. And, and what will it take? Will it take this same patient, persistent effort uh, by states and NGOs uh, to address these uh, particular areas? You see, um, I wrote a chapter of the Oxford Handbook on international human rights law, and the chapter is on the normative process. And in this, when the International Law Commission was established in 1945, when it met in 1947, it commissioned by the same Sahar Schlauterpark a survey of international law. And he discussed areas that the commission um, might focus on in its work. Well, now in the human rights field, we were just talking about it. This has been very much an ad hoc process. And in my chapter for the Oxford Handbook, I suggested that from time to time, the Human Rights Council should have like say, an agenda for future norms, mm. a discussion paper. Say, okay, let's think about this and let's think about that. Maybe call in some think pieces and so that it's not left entirely to chance. For the purposes of this discussion, I would mention three areas that um, I think, let's just say, one should think about. Uh, the whole area of human rights and scientific and technological developments. There are many facets of this. There is an, uh, at one stage, the United Nations uh, Subcommission on Human Rights had a program on this and they did a numerous uh, reports and studies. And this topic has fallen by the wayside. There is an Sri Lankan Australian professor who subsequently served on the International Court of Justice Mr. Justice Wiramantri. And Mr. Justice Wiramantri wrote a book on human rights and scientific and technological developments. Well, cut a long story short, I think that this is an area that needs a think piece and a part, like the whole idea of um, the singularity, humans and artificial intelligence and whatnot. I was just gonna I say artificial intelligence. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> very much. And bioethics. Mm -hmm. Bioethics. Um, so, but I, I've grouped all of these under the uh, the heading of human rights and scientific and technological development. It's a bit far fetched, but when I was at the London School of Economics, I earned a diploma in air and space law. I'm not a kind of self promoting <laughs> here, but I think the humans are about to go into space. When the first um, um, let me use the word expeditions were launched in space. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution, space, um, outer space is the common heritage of humanity. 
well, right now I think that we need some we need some work here. We need to think about this. And then, of course, um, in many systems, before you actually go into the process of legislative drafting, you have like a white paper. The white paper is discussing the issues, giving governments a chance to think through them. I think we need a white paper there. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'll stop with those two areas. And then now this whole area also of new forms of discrimination. The UN has been struggling since the Durban conference in 2001 as to whether or not it could supplement its standards in the area of uh, discrimination. I think that uh, this whole area of human rights and non-discrimination. So I'll, I'll stop there, but let me make the point in this way. I think we need a think piece. And this could be done in, in the academic world even. Somebody, a group of people ought to sit down and say, well, yes, let's help to think this through. Very interesting, because I think you could put certainly uh, issues related to gender identity yes. uh, and indigenous yes. people both fall in those areas. Where exactly so, exactly to get so. declarations exactly. or any resolutions. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's a great exactly. deal of controversy, but but yeah, you're right. I think peace could be particularly particularly useful. Where do you think, in what ways, has the UN actually been able to provide some protection for those whose human rights are violated? You see, Peggy, I wrote a book um, called Contemporary Human Rights Ideas. It is now in second edition. And when the reason for mentioning this book, in this book, I have a chart. Mm. And I, I listed a number of areas of the activities of the United Nations under the banner of protection. And um, I scale them one to 10. And I shocked some of my own friends and colleagues when I said that the highest rating for protection that I would give of any part of the UN uh, human rights uh, machinery are the investigators and I would only rate them a three out of 10 because protection means that you are putting a protective shield around people who are either at risk or who are undergoing violations. Yeah. But I am afraid that not much of that happens. And as you know rather well, even the great security council doesn't really engage in protection so now, but at the same time, I want to be fair here. I think that uh, one can refer to what I would call, I've already discussed normative protection. The idea of drafting the norms is hopefully to prevent when the phenomena of disappearances surfaced in Argentina and Chile in the 70s, the NGOs launched the idea that we should have a convention against enforced and involuntary disappearances. Now, enforced and involuntary dis- disappearances are still rampant in many parts of the world. But nevertheless, the convention is there. And it, so I want, to, I want to give some credit to normative protection. Then I want to refer to what I would call jurisprudential protection. Under the UN Human Rights Treaties, there has been some significant jurisprudence. Some years ago in Canada, there was a case involving a Maliseet Indian woman, um, and mm-hmm. according to the, the Lovelace case, and according um, to the, the Canadian law, um, if a woman married outside of the tribe, she lost her rights on the, re- on the reservation, but not a man. And the Canadian government wanted to change this, but this case went all the way up to the Canadian Supreme Court, which held against Sandra Lovelace. Then she brought a case to the UN Human Rights Committee that operates under the Civil and uh, Political Covenant. And the Human Rights Committee held that she was denied the right to live in community with members of her tribe. A great, great decision. So I can give many other reasons. So I would accredit jurisprudential protection. Then I want to put in what I would call fact-finding protection. The most authoritative source of the documents, violations of human rights in the world still are the report, the annual reports of the UN fact finders that I referred to earlier. So the fact now when they do their report, sometimes 
and there are many of them. They do a lot of pages. Sometimes they get attention and sometimes they don't. But I think that we would, uh, these are the people that I, uh, I assessed the three out of 10, my highest assessment. <laughs> and then fourthly, I would have to give credit to what I would call diplomatic protection. Uthant in his memoirs, View from the UN, he tells the story that Jews were General, not- Former Secretary General Uthant. Former Secretary General, the first yes. Secretary General of the United Nations. In the pages of the New York Times, he was being pilloried for not doing enough to um, help protect Jews in the then Soviet Union and to help them emigrate. At the time, Uthant had made an arrangement with his senior Soviet under Secretary General and the Soviet government that they would quietly let people leave the Soviet Union. And Uthant writes that at the time when I was having significant successes, I could not speak about it. When I served as high commissioner, um, I had a case from Nigeria, a woman called Amina Lawal. Amina Lawal had allegedly committed adultery and she'd been sentenced to death by a Sharia court. And now as high commissioner, what did I do? I asked our legal advisor to prepare a brief that this is, would be contrary to international human rights law. I shared that brief discreetly with the Nigerians. I don't know if it had the influence, but the, the Nigerian Supreme Court subsequently overturned the sentence of death. I just cite that as an example of what mm -hmm. I call diplomatic protection. And you find instances of that sort of I've said basically the following things. Protection is putting a protective shield around people. The UN doesn't do that very well. Uh, the fact finders, I will give them a grade of three out of 10, but the UN strives to its utmost. Normative protection, jurisprudential protection, fact finding protection, and diplomatic protection, keeping in mind what I said at the outset that the human rights pillar is still in crisis. You've shed some interesting light on the possibilities of what a UN High Commissioner for Human Rights can do. Uh, what, what often seems, however, like a thankless job of yeah. trying to get governments to stop gross violations of human rights. Yeah. And I wonder if, if you have another story you might share of either your own experience or another one of the High Commissioners who has made a difference in protecting a particular individual or more generally in promoting human rights. I would like to answer your question in this way. I think that there is need for scholarly investigation of the evolution of the position of High Commissioner. You see, as I look at it right now, I'm going to use my words carefully and without comment on any occupant. I have respect for them all. I know they have a difficult job. So that at a time when the international landscape is so difficult to operate in. The difficulties tell also on high commissioners. A high commissioner wears many hats. A high commissioner wears a moral hat, mm -hmm. a political hat, mm -hmm. and an administrative hat. Mm -hmm. The moral hat is the high commissioner should represent the voice of conscience. And so, okay, if the high commissioner goes out there like a voice in the wilderness without any real authority, it's not so easy. So that's the moral hat. The political hat, the high commissioner has to recognize the political forces that are at large in the world. And if a high commissioner ignores those political forces, the high commissioner is not going to get very far. And then the administrative hat, apart from the fact that you have to administer, they, they have some 1,000 uh, personnel right now. It is a fact of life that powerful states are squeezing the high commissioners all the time in, in key areas of the program because they have to vote the budgets. 
I want to tell you a story that happened to me. I went once when I was high commissioner before a body called the administrative committee, uh, the, the administrative committee, the, yeah, the uh, administrative ACABQ. committee. ACABQ. ACABQ, right. I, I was getting the one that the second <laughs> A wrong. Administrative advisory committee on administrative and budgetary questions. And then there was a delegate. He was, a, I will not mention the country. He was a rather obnoxious individual. And so he uh, asked me a question, which I tried to answer in good faith, but he wanted to show off. And so he took the floor and he said, Hi, Commissioner, I have to tell you this. You have not really answered my question. And unless you answer my question, you will not get a penny of your program. Now, this obnoxious pipsqueak could, could marshal a lot of support. So anyhow, a high commissioner has to navigate these three hats. When I finished the 14 months as high commissioner, I wrote a book called A UN High Commissioner in Defense of Human Rights. <laughs> and init initially, I gave it the subtitle, Leadership, Troubleshooting, and Diplomacy, which I didn't retain in the end, but hold these three words, leadership. A high commissioner must lead intellectually. A high commissioner must engage in troubleshooting in situations of difficulties. And a high commissioner must engage in diplomacy. Now, I want to bring in two concepts. When I used to teach human rights at Columbia University, I found myself saying to my students that one can put human rights work into two categories, the category of seed planting and the category of the fire brigade. The fire brigade is putting out the fire, hopefully, but what really matters is seed planting and the core seed to be planted. There are two seeds rather to be planted. The first seed is to help countries establish or enhance their national protection systems. And the second seed is to teach human rights in primary, secondary, and other mm -hmm. institutions of learning. So now, if you think about it, when I've thought about it, keeping in mind the political currents that are at work in the world, if I had to spend the time of the High Commissioner, I would say that the High Commissioner should remember my three words, lead intellectually at a time when universality is on the challenge. Right. I, that's what I mean by lead. Troubleshooting. There are situations that clearly call for the attention of the High Commissioner. And diplomacy. The High Commissioner should go out there and talk to the government of my country, Guyana. Say, Guyana, can we talk discreetly about how we can enhance your national protection system? So discharging the responsibilities of the High Commissioner called, I, I'm speaking now, if, if I may, Peggy, I'm speaking now, uh, allow me to take on the mantle of a pseudo scholar as I, as I address this issue. I am not being judgmental, I am being reflective, but I think that a High Commissioner has to carefully assess where he, she or he can best make a contribution. I want to give you an example, if I may. There was a moment when Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State and Mary Robinson was the High Commissioner. I was her deputy at the time. And Madeleine Albright came then to the Commission on Human Rights. And Mary Robinson was a woman of high integrity, high principles. And so she had a 45 minutes meeting with Madeleine Albright and she proceeded to lecture Madeleine Albright on the death penalty in the United States. And I could not help thinking, was that the wisest way for her to use her time? Might she have said to the Secretary of State, Secretary of State, there are issues that I'd like to discuss with you on some occasion, including the death penalty in the United States. But may I focus this conversation on areas where you might be able to help me spread the human rights cause the mission around the world. So th 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 there are many issues there. So what I'm saying to you, launch a political science study <laughs> into, into, into the, 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 the office of the High Commissioner. We need some dispassionate thinking here. 
Or a lesson in, in politics, the art of the possible. <laughs> yeah, the art of the possible, always keeping in mind. I, I, I need to bring in this concept. I have what I call the, the theory of expanding circles when it comes to human rights. At the center of, of some circles is a dot that I call the center of commitment. And outside of the first dot, there's a small circle, this, uh, what I call the circle of achievement. And outside of that, there is another circle that I call the circle of immediate opportunities. And outside of that is a wide, wide, wide circle, the circle of the world with all of its problems. Well, the challenge is to keep pushing outwards the circle of achievement. I don't want to bow entirely to the concept of the art of the possible. I like my presentation <laughs> of, of the expanding circles. Right. I, I think we would be remiss if we didn't touch briefly, at least, on the Human Rights Council um, in, this, in this conversation, Bertie. Um, you know, that when it was created in 2006, yeah. hope was that it would correct some of the flaws of its predecessor, the Commission on Human Rights. Yeah. Yeah. Yet now we see the Council mirroring some of the same problems that were present in the human, old Human Rights Commission, with countries such as Saudi Arabia and Russia and China being elected as members, despite the expectation that states' contributions to the promotion and protection of human rights would be important considerations in their election. Now, you've talked just recently about the political and financial pressures on the High Commissioner. Um, to be less critical of governments, to use softer methods, uh, and so on. But what hope do we have if we now have the commission slide, our council, excuse me, sliding in the direction of, of its predecessor and becoming more and more, one might say, politicized, few more of its members being clear violators of human rights? I want to answer you first as the professor of political science, if I may. When the Commission on Human Rights was under stress for this very issue of what I would call insalubrious governments <laughs> finding membership on the Commission, I had, um, I had Co Secretary General Kofi Annan call me up for a discussion. And in that discussion, I told him, I said, when the Commission on Human Rights was established, there was a procedure never used whereby governments elected on the commission would inform the secretary general of the proposed name of their representatives and the secretary general would engage in a process of consultation with the government and so this had never happened and so in the course of that so i told him that we need to see if there might be ways in which we could kind of help reinforce the integrity of membership in the commission. He, to his credit, he asked me, could we elect the members of the commission in the way we elect judges of the World Court? Well, I don't think that governments would agree to that, but he asked me for a paper on the subject, which I did put up to him. So anyhow, the, the, the reason for telling you this is that at the time, there might have been ways of addressing the difficulties of the commission that would have addressed the root causes, namely the spots of the governmental leopards. And in the, in the Human Rights Council, the spots of the governmental leopards have remained the same. So now we're back to this inherent structural problem. Now, the idea was when the council was established that regions would have open contests for membership. We have more and more regional slates. And that's why some of these insalubrious governments still get elected. That's the first thing. The second thing, in the United Nations, which is a political body, Governments are engaging in mutual protection and mutual protection still takes place in the Human Rights Council. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now having said that, I recently was in a panel discussion on the Human Rights Council 
there are undoubtedly good things that happen in the Human Rights Council. It can meet in special session at short notice. It can respond to situations of gross violations. It can establish commissions of inquiry, which it does. It can um, consult among its membership and seek the marshal uh, attention uh, to situations of concern. So there are some good things that have taken place in the council, but this brings us back to the point that where, where I started. At the end of the day, if gross violations of human rights are rampant in the world and the mantra in the council still is that the council must engage in dialogue and cooperation, we have a deep, deep, deep ethical and political problem. So now, at the end of the day, I spent 33 years in the United Nations and allow me to say so the great bulk was in the human rights area. I wrote a book uh, in called The Advent of Universal Protection of Human Rights, which focuses on Theo van Boven as the director of human rights, and I was his special assistant. Mm -hmm. And in the point that I want to make is, is I have seen the I have seen the process and participated in the process. Those who are in and around the UN they have to try to help the UN function to the extent that this is possible. And why do I say this? Those who are now around the Human Rights Council have to ask themselves the question, are there areas in which it might be possible to draw maximum benefit from the Council? Well, within the Council, there is something called the Universal Periodic Review Process. Right. Now, within that process, I think that the outcome of that process is still largely inchoate. We don't, we, we don't know what it gives to each government. Now, go back to two concepts that I have tried to put before you so far, the fire brigade and the seed planting. The fire brigade function of the council is under stress. There is room to... There is room to um, to expand the seed planting function of the Human Rights Council. And I actually think that where policy should be focused is that based on the documentation and the consultations that take place under the universal periodic review process, the United Nations should try to publish periodically a report on a global report on national protection systems a positively oriented report so as to help governments do better when it comes to protecting human rights. So going back to the, um, to the Human Rights Council still, the fire brigade and the seed planting, I have to be honest and tell you that the council remains vulnerable when it comes to dealing with gross violations of human rights. Because in the world now, let, let's just mention a few practical phenomena. Let me start with your own country. Historically, your country has shielded its friends and sought to punish its adversaries when it comes to human rights. That's always been the case. That's number one. Number two, I started deliberately with your country out of, out of fairness. Number two, if you look at... Um, there is a Chinese judge of the World Court, uh, Judge Su Hanking, and she basically says in a course of lectures that she gave at the Hague Academy of International Law, which is published, our pursuit of human rights is based on socialism with Chinese characteristics. characteristics. Yeah, so now, and then uh, in Russia, they advocate what are known as sovereign rights. One of the things that I have not addressed sufficiently in this interview is the challenge to universality coming from these powerful states. So that at the end of the day, yeah, your question to me is, how can, well, in answering your question, I'm saying that we need some reflection on how we might be able to help the Human Rights Council define a role where it can serve the world without 
and trapping itself in the shoals of real power politics. I want to tell you a little um, anecdote. I've just decided to do a course on global security and strategy. And my son, who, is, who teaches these subjects, now the son is teaching the father. My son says to me, um, you must focus on international organizations and the good that they do in the world. And then I said to him, well, now listen, I have to focus on the power that moves the world. So right. now the Human Rights Council has to navigate its way in the world of power. So anyhow, I'll give you a long-winded answer, forgive me, but you can, you, as you can see, I've spent some time reflecting on these issues. And right. uh, at the end of the day, you ask me, so I'm just doing the best I can in answer. You've done very well. I want to close with a very quick question. Yeah. That this, this interview is scheduled to air just shortly before this is the uh, 72nd anniversary of, of the Universal Declaration of Human yeah. Rights uh, in 1948. Uh, and I wonder if there is one thing you might name that you would celebrate about what the UN has been able to accomplish in the area, in this pillar of human rights. I would have to say immediately that the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is by far the most inspira inspirational and practical and political event in the history of the United Nations ever. I, um, forgive me for mentioning it, but I did a book uh, called Asia and the Drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I have a book that has just come out a little uh, month or two ago, A History of the UN Human Rights Program and Secretary. So at the end of the day, Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has a provision that reads as follows. Everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights stated in this declaration may be realized. It is an ennobling provision. And you know, John Humphrey, uh, the, one of the lead drafters of the declaration, I've not only read his memoirs, he has four volume of his diaries. And in his diaries, he tells of what it took to get the Universal Declaration adopted. And over the years, I will, not, I will leave aside the fact that it has been translated into some 400 uh, languages in the world and whatnot. But at the end of the day, I think that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the rallying document of our civilization. Mm, that's a lovely phrase. Yeah, so that's, I'm glad you agree, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's and that, that makes a that makes that makes an upbeat note on which to end in an, in talking about an aspect of UN work that is often not so upbeat. Uh, but this has been a very rich interview, Bertie, and I want to thank you very very much for giving so generously of your time to write both the essay that appears in the special issue of Ethics and International Affairs as well as doing the interview with me today. It's been great to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both, Peggy and, and Bertrand, for joining us. Um, that was a, a delightful conversation. Um, this, this has once again been a conversation between our host, uh, Dr. Margaret Carnes, and her guest, uh, Dr. Bertrand Ramcharan, as part of the Ethics and International Affairs series, The United Nations at 75, Looking Back to Look Forward, uh, produced by the Carnegie Council. Once again, my name is Adam Reed Brown. I'm the editor of the Council's journal, Ethics and International Affairs. And if you haven't already, please check out the other episodes in this series. Uh, Dr. Karn speaks with David Malone on the Security Council and the legacy of the UN at 75, with Maria Ivanova on environmental efforts at the UN, and with Nolene Heitzer on women in the UN system. For more information about this and other Carnegie Council programs, visit carnegiecouncil.org. And for more information about the Council's journal, including our recent special issue on the UN at 75, visit eiajournal.org. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the program.